Hey class, and welcome to uh, spring 2020. I hope everybody had a happy new year, great winter break. Um, so this is week one of environmental and all hazards management law. Um, I know that title's quite the mouthful, so I'm more than likely just gonna refer to this course as environmental and disaster law. My name is Jen Gartner. I will be your instructor for this semester. Um, I used to work physically at the School of Public Affairs at CU Denver, and I've been teaching graduate level classes for about whew, 15 years now. Um, so for my day job, I'm Associate General Counsel at the University of Maryland College Park, um, located just north of Washington, DC. I work in the field of administrative law. That encompasses almost every type of government regulation imaginable. And so we're gonna talk about administrative law um, a bit more in depth later in this lecture. Um, and that's because environmental law and all hazards management law are in part subsets of admin law. So as an attorney, I've got my Juris Doctor, uh, my JD. I've also got a Master's of Public Administration. I do not, though, have a PhD, so there's no need to call me Dr. Gartner. Please feel free to call me Jen, uh, Professor Jen, Professor Gartner, whatever you're most comfortable with. I'm gonna break up this week one lecture into two parts. Um, we've got part one, this part, which is gonna provide an overview of the course itself, course materials, and some other administrative details. And then part two is gonna be a substantive lecture about admin law, um, environmental law, and just a tiny little bit about all hazards management. So this is the second time that this class has been offered. Um, you're not quite my guinea pigs, but it's still a fairly new class. So please flag anything that you really like or you really don't, because at the end of the course, I'm gonna ask about, um, I'm gonna ask for your feedback. Um, I've been asking students for feedback uh, after every class that I teach, and I do like to incorporate that into sort of that next iteration of the class. So I was asked by SPA to combine environmental law with the law of all hazards management and to um, combine a public administration course with a criminal justice course. And at first, these seemed like really distinct and separate topics to me. But the more that I thought about it, there are a lot of areas of overlap. Um, so first and foremost, like I said, there is administrative law. And I was asked to create this class because of my background in admin law. So not all environmental or disaster law is administrative law, but if the EPA or the Forest Service or FEMA or any other government agency is involved, then you are dealing at least in part with administrative law. Additionally, emergency managers often have to in, uh, deal with environmental disasters. And this is becoming ever more true as our climate changes. And I'm gonna speak um, very briefly about this towards the end of this week's lecture. So my career has always touched on issues of environmental and disaster law. Um, my master's capstone focused on court competencies, which included things like risk management and emergency planning. Um, early in my legal career, I worked at a huge international law firm and I represented a lot of clients who were involved in environmental cleanup, um, often as EPA contractors. And now I work at a large land grant university, which like CU is a state government agency. And a large university is a lot like a city. You know, we've got housing, we've got restaurants, both sit down and fast food. Plus we've got, you know, dining hall. Uh, we've got stores and libraries and public buildings, stadiums, department of transportation. We've got a farm, a health center, a performing arts center, uh, nearly 2000 different laboratories some of which require environmental permitting. You know, we have to plan for active shooter scenarios, health epidemics, biosafety issues, um, release of hazardous materials. And because we've got a nuclear research reactor on campus, we even have to um, prepare for radiation safety matters. And so I really hope that all of my professional experiences, as well as your own experiences, are gonna allow us to have a really interesting and informative semester. Okay, so what are we gonna do this semester? In this class, we're gonna examine aspects of environmental law, natural resources law, disaster law, and hazard management. So these areas of law and policies are very intertwined and they do fall under this um, umbrella of administrative law when there's agency action involved. And there usually is some type of agency action involved when we're talking about environmental regulations or emergency management because executive branch agencies are the ones that are tasked with addressing these topics. So this week, I'm gonna provide a real basic overview of these fields of law. Next week, we're gonna start talking about the branches and functions of government. We're also gonna cover legal research for non-lawyers, 
uh, because as the name of the course implies, we're gonna spend a lot of time dealing with the law, statutes, regulations, and case law. So don't be put off by the legal research aspect. Um, students usually can find it a little confusing, even a little bit scary at first, but that is totally normal. And most students wind up realizing that legal research is useful not just for class, but also for their careers. And I'm gonna walk you through it, um, so don't worry about it. After that, we're really gonna get into agency actions, how we hold our agencies accountable through constitutional law, through a court system. Then we're gonna turn our attention to state and local risk management and disaster response. And then finally, we'll cover some special issues for both environmental law and disaster management, um, such as how to regulate and respond to emergencies involving toxic substances. We'll talk about some global environmental issues, um, and then also how best to manage legal resources at your agency or within your organization. So in this class, we've got a textbook. Um, we also have a book, uh, Civil Action, and we've got reading handouts. Um, there is a movie version of a Civil Action, and it's generally pretty good, but I really urge you to read the book. The book is fascinating because the author was actually embedded with the attorneys throughout their case. And that case deals with environmental pollution uh, that impacted residents of a Massachusetts town. So get started on a civil action um, as soon as you think you need to. We're gonna discuss it after spring break, uh, but do get started on it. Uh, most students find it to be a really interesting book. Actually, everybody who I taught for this class last time urged me to keep it. Um, that was one of the things that they really, really liked. So I hope you enjoy it too. Your grade in this class is going to be based on a variety of items, um, discussions, assignments, and news items. We're gonna have 10 discussions total, but only eight of them are graded. Uh, so the first one's not graded, and then I'm gonna automatically drop your lowest grade. Your written assignments are gonna be two memos, two case briefs, and a final policy analysis memo. These memos are intended to have a real world applicability. A lot of my former students have used them as writing samples for job applications um, or just to advance their careers, and I hope that you're going to find them useful as well. You're also going to post some news items, um, and these are going to help you get a feel for how pervasive administrative law, environmental law, and all hazards management law are throughout our lives. Uh, so your news items are just going to be articles related to our course topics. You're going to post those to a dedicated discussion board. Um, when I went and looked for news items on January 4th, pretty much every newspaper worldwide was just covering the Australian wildfires on the front page. Um, and that is both environmental law and disaster law. Our class, of course, is going to focus on U.S. laws and regulations. But it's important for local, state, and federal officials to learn from events in other countries. And then, of course, we also have mutual support agreements. Um, you know, the U.S. does send help to Australia um, and to other nations around the world. So here are some of the news items. Um, in Australia, there are state officials that are coming under fire, no pun intended. Uh, but for instance, the state of New South Wales um, fired the coordinator of their main environmental agencies. Um, the energy and environment minister over there has declined to comment, um, but basically it says that these two folks were clashing over strategy on issues ranging from allocation of firefighting staff to conservation is issues. So apparently these Australian officials disagreed on both environmental law and emergency management. Um, another story, NPR's got a story on a solar power microgrid. So you may remember last October, uh, PG&E, that's um, Pacific Gas and Electric, that's California's largest electric utility. They took this unprecedented step of shutting off power to millions of customers, and they did that because they wanted to prevent their power equipment from sparking these catastrophic wildfires that California has experienced. So there's a rural county, um, Humboldt County, and their emergency service managers knew that this power outage was coming, but they didn't know when, and then the whole county went dark. As you can imagine, this really disrupted the emergency management plans, um, particularly those related to protecting people who are on medical devices that depend on an uninterrupted energy supply. Now there's actually a renewable energy microgrid um, in a small 
California Native American reservation uh, called Blue Lake Rancheria. And that's actually providing one solution to this ongoing problem. And so in this story, you know, NPR covers how the tribe created a microgrid and they're basically storing power in these giant Tesla batteries. Um, so that's on one side of the country. On the other side, here in Maryland, uh, we've got a Republican governor and a Democratic attorney general, and they have teamed up to sue Pennsylvania for its failure to comply with a Chesapeake Bay cleanup plan. And they're also suing the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, for its failure to enforce that plan. Uh, we've got a news article about Puerto Rico. Um, you know, it was hurt, it was hit by Hurricane Maria. Um, and then early this month, it was hit by an earthquake, uh, the strongest one in a century. And aftershocks are continuing to sort of strike the island. And so power lines that were rebuilt after Hurricane Maria are fine, but the aging power plants were not rebuilt. And the facility that produces the most electricity on the island, that power plant, it may not return to service for up to a year. So that raises another concern because Puerto Rico is gonna face another hurricane season coming up. And we're gonna talk more about the recent earthquake in Puerto Rico when we examine the Stafford Act's role in disaster management. And that'll be a little bit later this semester. Um, I've got uh, two bonus news items. They are a little bit old, but they're odd enough that I thought they were worth sharing. So there is a Slate article from last year on why people keep asking if they can eat flamingos. Um, I have never asked that question and don't think that they would taste that good, but apparently a lot of people ask. So in the U.S., um, as in many other countries, hunting and eating flamingos is illegal. So for the most part, Migratory birds in the U.S. are protected under federal law, and the American flamingo falls under that protection. So flamingos nest together in large groups, which makes them particularly vulnerable to hunters. And they don't reach maturity until they're six or seven years old, at which point they lay only a single egg per year. So these are birds that do not do well in an open hunting season. And we know this because there used to be huge populations of flamingos in southern Florida, but in the 19th century, hunters started collecting them um, in large numbers uh, to sell their feathers for ladies' hats and also to eat their meat. And flamingos were essentially wiped out. Um, and so that is why they are now protected by federal law. Um, another strange little bonus news article is that last year the Boston Globe published this throwback story about the Great Boston Molasses Flood. Um, also known as the Boston Molassacre. And in January of 1919, a storage tank that was filled with 2.3 million gallons of molasses burst. And this huge wave of molasses swept through Boston um, at a speed of about 35 miles per hour. That's sufficient to sweep buildings off of their foundations and 11 people died. Um, and so for those of you who are interested in all hazards management, my guess is that you haven't really considered that you would ever have to deal with a wave of liquid sticky sweetener, but it is one of the bizarre things that all hazards managers uh, do have to think about. Okay, quick review of our course materials. We've got our Canvas classroom. Please take some time here at the start of the semester to familiarize yourself with the setup of our classroom and also the course materials that are available here. So not only are you responsible for knowing these materials, but they're also gonna supply you with valuable information that can affect your grade. Uh, please review the syllabus this week, read the whole thing if you haven't already. Um, note the syllabus has changed slightly. I've made a couple of uh, revisions. Um, so please use version two, which is posted in our Canvas classroom. You should also read the graded item guidelines. Um, you don't have to do that right now, but do please review them before you submit any graded materials because they're gonna help you get the best grade that you can. I also strongly suggest that you look through the student resources folder, particularly the grammar and writing folder. Um, so I realized that losing points for a failure to follow guidelines or for sloppy writing, that really might seem like I'm dwelling on just some minutia here, but this stuff is really important. Effective writing is one of the most important things that you can learn when you work in government. 
um, especially if you're communicating with the public or you're writing laws, regulations, and policies. So I've put together this grammar and writing resources folder. It's mostly lighthearted, fun stuff, but it's also stuff that can really help you as a writer. So please do take a look. And if you take nothing else away from this part of the lecture, please know that the Oxford comma, it's also called a serial comma, is awesome. And you can see that here in this little cartoon about JFK, Stalin, and the strippers. So the Oxford comma is the last comma before the and. And it really is necessary in law because it can change the meaning of laws and regulations. So in fact, uh, the absence of an Oxford comma cost a Maine dairy company about $5 million just a couple years ago. There was this lawsuit, it hinged on the Oxford comma and what its absence meant in the interpretation of a statute. So Google the story if you're interested, but the main takeaway is again, if you are drafting laws, regulations, or policies, use that Oxford comma, it's really important uh, it can wind up saving your agency or organization millions of dollars. So our course is organized into weekly modules. Each one unlocks at 12 a.m. on Monday. So our course week runs Monday through Sunday. Um, each module is gonna include an intro and lecture page that's gonna list your required readings for the week and any items due. It's also gonna include a narrated lecture and I'm providing the lecture slides in PDF format. Um, so again, please be sure to review the assignment guidelines and the discussion guidelines. Uh, to get a 100% on the discussion, you've got to post at least two times. Your first post is due Thursday night, and then a follow-up post is due um, by Sunday night. Assignments are due at the very end of the class week, Sunday by 11.59 p.m. Mountain Time. Okay, that is our little overview of sort of the course and our online classroom. Next up, please listen to part two of this lecture. That's gonna provide an overview of administrative law and two of its components, environmental law and all hazards management law.